color. In this video, I'm going to delve into color theory, but I'm going to couch it in nine practical tips that pretty much anybody could employ in their color work right away. But the general goal here is to understand color better, and that requires understanding the physical world better. Color theory is derived from an understanding of the harmonies of nature. But just like in drawing, if I ask someone to draw a horse, who has seen a horse before but they've never studied one, I'm probably going to get something that's kind of a tube with four stick legs coming out of it. But if someone has drawn a horse from life, they gain an understanding of its construction that they would otherwise miss by the careful attention to detail that comes with drawing. Color is the same way. We have to study the harmonies that we see within nature so that we better understand the construction and the relationships, and we can better employ and anticipate those harmonies when we utilize it within our work. This is one reason why people who paint traditionally tend to have a better understanding of color. The physical mixing of the paint is a tremendous aid in understanding the relationships between colors. But I'm not going to tell you just to go study nature and to go mix paints. I'm going to give you some practical tips that you can employ in your work that I have learned along the way that will help you understand color better or at least spur you to argue with me in the comment section. And most comics are colored digitally, so I'm going to talk about this primarily from a digital point of view. Number one, there are two kinds of color in a scene. Any scene is going to have two basic forms of color in play. There's going to be the local color, which is the color of the individual object. This pencil is yellow. And then there's also going to be the environmental color, which is the color of the light within the scene. When a beginning artist tends to paint or to illustrate, they usually emphasize local color and tend to forget about environmental color. If a new blade of grass is in fact green, that is true of its local color, but the light around it will influence that color to various directions. A bright yellow environment will tilt the green of the blade towards warmth, but a cool dawn will tilt it into a mellow blue. Just remember, you're never just coloring locations and figures. You are coloring locations and figures at a specific moment in time. And so the time of day and the weather conditions are basic questions you can ask yourself to expand your understanding of what kinds of colors could be used in the scene. Number two, there should always be cool and warm. Anyone who has ever taken an art class has probably encountered the complimentary color wheel. If you're like me, you may have been bewildered by the lack of answers as why exactly these opposite colors had any relationship to each other, especially when they are so flexible. So you, you hardly need a pure violet and yellow or a pure cyan and orange. Instead, there seems to be a lot of room to modify those. So if that's the case, what is the core principle that's actually in play here? I would argue that it's temperature. A good color palette has a range of warm and cool temperatures. Complementary colors, by virtue of being on the opposite side of the color wheel, make this a rather obvious distinction between hues. Also, warm and cool are relative concepts, so this gives us a lot of flexibility. Red is warmer than blue, but it is cooler than yellow. As long as something is warmer than what it is placed in conjunction with, then you will have a difference in temperature. Pretty much any composition you see will utilize this kind of distinction between warm and cool, and it's something that we expect because we encounter it in nature. Warm and cool is always present. Warm highlights advance and cool shadows recede. So knowing this basic paradigm, artists can improvise all kinds of various solutions that either emphasize the notion given between warm and cool, or perhaps even subvert it. Number three, gray, white, and black are mythical. This is mostly a digital problem, although I do see it some in beginning uh, painters as well. Pure gray, black, and white don't really exist. 
Or at least they're so rare that you'll never encounter them. Maybe if you're staring into a literal black hole. However, digital illustrators tend to use them like they have an addiction. Instead of white, black, and gray, think in terms of light color, dark color, and a saturated color. These are common colors in the real world rather than color Sasquatches. Number four, know the parts of color. I was far too old when I suddenly realized that since my thoughts were made up primarily of language, the rest are images, that increasing my vocabulary would increase my capacity and precision of thought. With color, having vocabulary that allows you to talk about its component parts allows you to be much more precise in your considerations concerning color. And here, I do not mean memorizing the nonsensical list of color names from your local hardware store. I do not believe that there's a color called belligerent mushroom. It's light brown. Instead, I'm talking about the basic variables that make up a color's parts. So there's hue, the position of the color along the actual spectrum of color, value, which is the lightness or darkness of a color, and saturation that measures the intensity between total desaturation and the maximum that's physically possible. There's a different range of possibility on digital, for example, versus what you can do with pigment. Knowing this kind of language is helpful and we will be using it from this point on. Number five, move the eye with warmth and light. James Gurney, the painter responsible for the Dinotopia series, says in his phenomenal book called Color and Light, to shadow the bottom half of a tower or a post to push the eye upward into the area of the composition where you want the viewer to go. Darkening the recessive areas knowing that humans are drawn towards the light. I use a variation of this idea constantly, darkening the bottom halves of figures to push the eye up towards the faces. This can be done with quite a bit of subtlety just using a gradient tool, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I do my color methods video. But this is an indispensable tool for visual hierarchy. Pushing the eye towards areas of interest using warmth and light. If you want more about visual hierarchy, you can click on the link and go to the video where I analyze the work of Danny Earls. But in general, just recognize human beings are drawn towards light and warmth by default. Knowing this, you can play with it, you can subvert it, you can do all kinds of interesting things. But understand that if you do try to subvert it, you will have to work around it and create emphasis using some other means. Most of the time, you're better off just to use this concept, this reality of how humans interact with things, to your advantage by operating within its constraints and emphasizing it within your work. I'm of the mind that restrictions are a good thing for artists. The boundaries help to facilitate creative solutions to problems. Although saying restrictions are a good thing around artists is a good way to get chased with pitchforks. Number six, use images from nature to study color. Take a natural image, one that has not been heavily photoshopped, and pull it into a software where you get that beloved eyedropper tool. Create a bunch of shapes, squares, circles along the side, usually about five of them, and then go in and pick from the areas of the image the colors that seem to best represent the breadth of its color palette. Then open those colors on the color picker and look at them carefully. What are the hues? What are the values? What are the saturation levels? This can be a, a very educational way to find out what kinds of relationships manifest within a natural setting and allow you to investigate concepts of local and environmental colors. Of course, this is even more potent if you just take a little set of acrylic paints Go out into the yard and paint what you see. Both of them work, but the classic methods are classic for a reason. Number seven, color palettes have leaders and followers. One thing you'll notice about colors very quickly within a natural setting is that the colors do not compete with each other. Whereas if I take blue and I take red and I take yellow and I overlap them with each other, your retinas burn out because the colors are competing with such vigorous intensity that you can barely focus on the combination of those colors in the same scene. 
But in a natural scene, the most intense colors will be the local colors of objects that are most similar to the color of the light source. And likewise, the colors that are furthest away from the light source will be neutralized by that light. As a consequence, you never really get competition between intense colors. So basically, a leader color emerges, and then the other colors fall into line behind it. I teach at a university, so I sit in the cafeteria and I watch students have lunch. And when a group of friends gets together and have lunch, the one who's the most aggressive personality tends to dictate the conversation of the table. The others within the friend group tend to recede a little bit and participate, but as though they are following as opposed to leading. However, if you get two really strong personalities in vicinity to each other, sometimes you get conflict and I get a very entertaining lunch. This is the same basic principle except nature is always in harmony and being in harmony within nature means clear leaders and followers. Nature is perfect order and that harmony comes from a clear hierarchy within the color palette. Shoot for minimum contrast, not maximum. So we're back here to one of the problems that comes up with that use of black and white, which is maximum contrast. The average newcomer in painting and color tends to push the colors, particularly their values, too far out to the edges. High amounts of contrast can create a lot of confusion for the reader. If you find yourself squinting to take in the complexity of a scene, it's likely that the contrast has been placed with too high of levels all over the frame and it's difficult to focus on what's important. That complexity needs to be reduced and that complexity is because of contrast. In general, work with midtones. I see this probably most prominently with skin tones because there's a great tendency within comic coloring to make skin tones very, very light or very, very dark when in reality they're quite a bit closer to each other. So in general, you should work with midtones and then only push out to very dark or very light sparingly in order to dictate the attention of the viewer rather than just our assumptions about how light or how dark something is. You could think of this as just trimming down excess contrast. You want to have just enough to pull the eye where it needs to go and nothing more. So start with less and push the contrast up to where it can be, but focus primarily first on midtones and then advance the contrast to where you're getting the distinction in the areas that are most important in the frame. This is a principle that you see broken quite well frequently. But for the newcomer, learn the rules so that you can understand their purpose well enough to judge when is a good moment that they should be broken. There's a big difference between innovation, which implies that you understand the landscape in which you are working, and ignorance, which is just the clumsy leaping forward of someone without really understanding what it is that they are or aren't doing. Number nine, color your inks. One of the greatest offenders of this contrast principle are inks themselves. Even though most comic work is digital now, we still default to black for the inks. And of course, the black your computer generates is more intense than what you'll get from good old India ink. So apply color to the inks and use dark colors since the lines still have to be darker than any of the color that they are meant to separate. And here, there's a limit to the colors that you can apply. When a color gets darker, the resolution goes down. In other words, less of the nuance of the color can be seen. Just like if you take a real world scene and you reduce the light, you can make out basic shapes, but probably not much else. When colors darken, we can only really make out their basic direction along the color wheel. Let's say each primary and secondary color, and maybe an extra one in between each. So ink color becomes like the bass notes on a piano. You can tell whether or not they harmonize, but they're probably not going to carry the melody. So I use inks to tilt towards warm and cool within the color palette. And the whole reason I mention this is because it makes it a better idea to do the ink color towards the end, clipping a color to the layer or coloring over the top of a layer that you're using for inks digitally. Doing that last rather than first just as a response to what it feels like the color palette needs. 
That last part there is one you could definitely try a different method. That's just something I have found to be useful in my own work. Number 10, use kicker colors. I remembered to add number 10 on later, so I'm recording this after sunset. The fundamentals of color theory involve color palettes of essentially two tones. You have the warm colors and you have the cool colors. And then you have a lot of other little colors that populate in between. Just like if you were using a complementary color scheme where it comes down to basically two sides of that circle. That is good color fundamentals. However, I have really come to love the concept of the kicker color. I honestly cannot remember if I made that term up or if I took it from someone else. So I have no idea who to credit here. But a kicker color is kind of like seasoning for your color entree. These are little colors that you throw in that might be completely dissociated from the rest of the palette. But when they're used in small measure, they lack the influence to throw off the balance of the rest of the palette. Obviously, you can have too much of a good thing here. Just like seasoning, uh, too much and the palate becomes unpleasant to the human taste. But when doled out gently, they add life and zest to the dish. Because I really can't seem to take this food metaphor far enough. They're delicious. Again, color is like music, so we can learn a lot from music fundamentals. Music carries a specific rhythm that stays consistent. Music maintains a certain key for a long period of time and operates with notes within that key. Color is the same way. It benefits from our restraint and self-discipline. Our eccentricities are to be doled out carefully, and primary principles only deviated from if you have found another path to the destination that the principle was trying to reach. At the end, the goal is harmony. Everything that operates together for the good of the total piece of artwork. If you'd like to see more of how I manage color, all of the pages here that I've shown are from a three-volume graphic novel that I've been working on for the last three years. The first two volumes are already available to purchase with money from my website, which is linked down below. It is Greek mythology, and it is adventure, and it is humor, and hedgehogs. And if you like what you saw here today, do like, share, and subscribe. Comment a piece of artwork or a graphic novel that has incredible color down below. And I will see you in the next video.